So yeah, apologies for that. For some reason, my uh, laptop decided to disappear at a critical moment, but hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, my name is Matt Wallace. I'm from Mockingbird Consulting. And we help people connect with their environment. We're about three years old. Uh, we've spent the last 18 months focusing on farming and agriculture. And with the lockdown that came along with COVID-19 and all the rest of it, uh, we've started to focus on commercial and industrial as well, and, and indeed the retail space. Because what we found is that there's a lot of the challenges that farmers face around safety and managing risk um, it can be very easily applied to these other uh, things. So just to start off, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about data versus information. Now, most of you who are on this call will be aware of the difference, but just to make sure that we're all talking about stuff coming from the same perspective, um, I just I just want to make sure this is clear. And as I go through the presentation, this is something that it'd be really good for you to sort of keep in your head, um, it, just because it, it's, it's key to what we do here at Mockingbird Consulting, and it's also key to how you can use artificial intelligence and, and other kinds of data analysis uh, to help you make better decisions, which is, which is really what we're all about. So we've got loads and loads of sensors out there. They measure all sorts of things. I'll talk about them in a bit. Um, but usually all we get back from them is a number. And I mean, 90 is great, but we haven't got a clue what it is. Is it 90 stars? Is it 90 people? 90 cows, that's fairly small herd for most of our customers. Um, but you know, it, it's 90 something. And then we start to get a qualifier that it's, well, it's 90 degrees. Okay, well, that, that's better, because now we know it's not stars, people, or cows, because we don't count them in degrees, but it might be an angle, or it might be a temperature. So is there another qualifier we can look for? Well, it's either Fahrenheit or it's Celsius, and if it's Fahrenheit, then it's probably a nice warm day. If it's Celsius, we've probably either got health issues, um, if it's in a, a shop or a factory or something like that, uh, or if it's in a, a vac container that needs to be at 200, 300 degrees for whatever reason, because it's storing some kind of industrial chemical that needs to be stored at those kinds of levels, then we're probably well outside the operating conditions. So 90 on its own is pretty useless to us, but by the time we've added all these qualifiers to it, we've got the information that we need, and it's the information that guides us making better decisions, not the data. So, as I say, just keep that in your mind as we go through this. Um, we're going to look at risks. We're going to obviously cover COVID-19 and social distancing, things like that. But I'm also going to talk about some of the other risks that people have been facing long before coronavirus turned up. And then I'll go on to talk a bit about the kind of solutions you might want to look at putting in place to try and resolve some of these things. Now, what I will say is that this is a huge topic to cover. There are sensors out there that will monitor and measure just about anything that you'd care to look for. And as a result, I'm going to touch briefly on the surface, but there will be times for questions at the end. Um, and I'm more than happy to pass on my contact details as well. So if anyone's got any con other burning questions afterwards, I'd be more than happy to pick up an email, pick up the phone, have a conversation around. Them. So let's look at some of the challenges that we're facing today at the moment. Um, we've got coronavirus, obviously. There's the social distancing, and by now we all know, um, and are probably quite bored, even though it's still incredibly important, um, of all of the posters that are up around this. You know, stay two meters away. You know, we've got these new bubbles that came in at the weekend or in England. Um, here in Wales, it's still very strict. You know, we're allowed to meet members of one other household as long as we're only in the back garden or in a public space and things like that. So it's something that's not going to go away. And actually, I'd be amazed if social distancing has gone by this time next year. Um, and that's not because I'm particularly pessimistic about things. I just think it's going to take that long for a vaccine to turn up. And as we're all, we all know, it's, it's when the vaccine arrives that we can be confident that social distancing can go. And the other thing is environmental management. You all will have seen the studies that say that have said that uh, you know air quality has improved dramatically since lockdown, and there's no real surprise in that because everyone's stopped driving their cars, and there's far fewer lorries on the road and things like that. So we'd kind of expect to see that. And there's some fantastic photos of places like Delhi and India and other 
capitals that are usually just filled with smog with bright blue skies um, in the background. But there's other studies that are starting to emerge that are suggesting that COVID-19 and the coronavirus can almost hitch a ride on the back of particulate matter. And so if we do start to see those levels of particulate matter and pollution creep up, there is a chance that we might actually start to see a faster spread of coronavirus again. So coronavirus, with it comes to coronavirus at the moment, it is social distancing, it's about making sure that our customers and our staff are safe and can get on with their work. And it's also about environmental management. But some of the other challenges that we've been looking at around risk are things like escaping livestock in farming, which is not just a headache for the farmers, but is a headache for the local emergency services, it's a headache if they get into roads and all sorts of things like that. And so what can we do to help mitigate that kind of risk? And also maintenance. If you've got a tractor that's been you know, in the fields, literally in the fields uh, for, for years, and you're just sort of fixing it every time there's a bit of a rattle that you've not heard before, then there's a big risk there that someone else who doesn't know the tractor as well as you do could jump into it, take it out across the field, not notice a rattle that shouldn't be there. And as a result, there could be an accident. And the same goes for forklift trucks, for tugs, all of that kind of thing around uh, industrial complexes. And then looking at the retail and commercial and industrial, again, we're looking at staff movement around social distancing, but also around some of the roles that the staff undertake. Are there things that can be automated? Are there things where we can do more effective, are there more effective ways of undertaking those roles or getting the same results? so that staff can actually be repurposed somewhere else, perhaps, where they, they'll deliver better value. There's customer and staff well-being. I've already touched briefly on coronavirus being able to hitch a ride on the, on the particulate matter. Um, but, you know, there's lots of other things that come into the, the well-being and, and the environment, light levels and, you know, CO2 levels and all of that kind of thing as well. Um, and that kind of feeds nicely into the environmental conditions in which we work. But environmental conditions aren't necessarily just about the air pollution and how hot it is. It could be things like working in restricted spaces. So over the next while, while, we, while I talk about this, these are the kind of areas that we're going to be talking about in detail. And I'll also be able to show you some of the sensors that we've got that we're using um, to, to mitigate some of these risks already. So let's look at the coronavirus risks. Um, that's London. You can see Battersea Power Station in the in the distance. I, I may live in Wales, but uh, I grew up in the southeast, and I love love London. Um, at the moment, I have absolutely no intention to travel there at all because it's just so busy. And if you think of the social distancing challenges that you've got in London, just from a daily commute perspective, you've got all of these people mixing with each other and potentially infecting each other and then bringing them into your offices, into your shops, into your factories. So there's got to be a way in which we can mitigate the risk. We can't do anything about it once it's on, while people are on the tube or on the buses. That's London Transport's problem, quite frankly. Um, and from what I'm reading, they seem to be doing a reasonably good job. But as soon as people come onto our premises, we've got responsibility, we've got this duty of care uh, to look after them. So there's things like equipment checks. Are your fridges and freezers working? What's your networking equipment doing? If you're in a factory, what are your production lines doing? All of that kind of things. Are there ways in which we can mitigate risk in those situations? Confined space working. I, my background's IT. I've been working in IT for 20 odd years. And the number of times I've ended up in a tiny little loft space, unplugging and plugging cables in with a colleague literally rubbing shoulders with me while they work on the rack behind me or next to me or whatever it is to, to patch all the cables. You know, how, how do you protect your staff in those kinds of environments? How do we ensure that our customers and our staff flow through the building in a way that lessens the chances of them becoming infected should someone else have it? And more and more we're seeing these alternative ordering methods, this idea of click or call and collect. And especially here in Wales, we're seeing a lot of the smaller independent companies who are suddenly saying, oh, well, maybe we should do something. And they'll put a post up on Facebook saying, give us a ring if you think there's something we might have in stock. 
And then if you drive over, we'll load it into your boot for you and you can drive off again. And we won't need to, have, no one will need to have sort of shaken any hands. You won't, you know, you pay us over the phone and all the rest of it. But that's creating logistics issues as well for them because they've never been in this position. They're not Amazon, they're not Morrisons or Tesco or whoever. They're not geared up for this kind of thing. So how can we help organizations like that implement those kinds of policies and procedures? This is one chap, I'm sure many of you have seen, uh, seen this flying around the internet, who uh, came up with his own novel idea of keeping people at a distance whilst in a supermarket. Um, we're pretty confident there's a better way of doing it than this, uh, although maybe not as cheap as what's that four or five pool noodles uh, taped to your head. Um, and I'll come on to an example of how we think we can better do at least customer flow uh, towards, the end of, towards the end of today's presentation. Farming, as I say, is a, a big area of ours, but there's lots that we've learned over the last few years that can equally be applied to other places. So we do have issues with escaping livestock. Um, and this can be anything from the goats jumping over fences and then you have to work out where in the fence they jumped over and then you've got to go back and repair the fence and all of that. Right the way through to people deliberately leaving gates open because they've got a dispute with their next door neighbour. Um, there's equipment maintenance, as I say, you know, you've got to be able to be confident in any equipment, especially if you've got your own staff. And this is one that translates nicely over to, to the industrial complex. Um, side of things. You've got to be confident that the equipment that your staff are driving and using on a day-to-day -day basis is safe. And this is a good example of the escaping livestock. So the, this is only last month, uh, end of last month, 35 cows managed to get onto the M25, held up, carry, uh, held up the traffic for a good couple of hours. And of course it's not just the people that are stuck in the cars that are frustrated and potentially at risk from the cattle. But you've got the emergency services that turn up on site to deal with all of the traffic, highways agency, you've got the farmer themselves and the farmer's staff who now have to go onto one of the, you know, the busiest motorway in the UK to try and herd their animals back. And you can see from the sub headline there, according to reports, the animals made it as far as Clackett Lane services, a mile away from where they've escaped. So this isn't just sort of a couple of cows a few feet from the field and you can just sort of shoo them back up the hill and then the thing, they're a mile away. So you've got to get your trailers in place and you've got to go and pick them up from wherever they are and bring them back to the fields and everything like that. And sometimes the consequences, the causes are even simpler, but the consequences are actually even worse. So this is a tweet from earlier this month. Um, some ramblers out on their daily exercise um, decided they were going to leave the gate, the two gates open. So this young bull went off for a walk and ended up in a paddock with a larger bull who took quite a bit of offence at the fact that there was another bull in the same field. Um, and, and yeah, and they're now having to care for this younger bull um, because they didn't get on at all. And so this tiny little consequence of someone leaving a gate open on a right of way, it's damaged the livestock. There is a chance that it could have injured other people. There was a gentleman the other week that was killed by a herd of cows uh, as he walked across a field. And there's also a chance if it was common ground or something like that, that the, far, the cows could have got down to people's back gardens and caused you know, damage to people's property and things like that. So looking at the commercial and retail side of things, as I say, there's, there's the working in the confined spaces, um, shut up in the little loft hatches and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, there's customer and staff flow, there's the environmental conditions and there's these new ways of working. And what we want to do and what I, what I want to try and talk about now is, is how we can use the Internet of Things to collect the data that we need and then use platforms to analyse that data and give us the information that we need in order to make better decisions. So this is a possible solution. Okay? This is what we tend to install on our client sites for people who aren't in the agricultural field. And I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, I hope you can, but in the top left-hand corner, we've got a small box, sits on the wall, battery powered, 
All of these are, are battery powered, by the way. Um, they sit on the wall and it'll take room temperature, humidity, occupancy, air quality, so CO2 levels and things like that. We've got more advanced ones coming in that will give you the particulate matter inside your office. We've got fridge and freezer temperature monitors. We've got customizable feedback buttons so that you can ask your staff how they think, how you th they think that things are going post lockdown. You know, on the way out of the, the loos, we've all seen these at airports and some cafes and things like that. This, and in shops as you go past the checkouts, these feedback buttons, you know, how was it? What, what do you think? And so maybe now the questions with the customizable feedback buttons are not were the toilets clean, but they're on the way out of the office that says, how are you feeling today? You know, do you feel, you know, do you feel you've got any symptoms of coronavirus? It's anonymous. People are more likely to fill it in. It's not so helpful for tracking it, but you'd hope they're filling in the app as well. Um, or, you know, how well do you feel we're doing when it comes to handing out PPE equipment to staff? All of that kind of thing. But again, out of all of these, all you're going to get is a number for each of the measurements. And they'll be sent over the Wi-Fi, over this wireless network. We use something called LoRaWAN, um, which is a low power, long range network. Um, to digress ever so slightly, one of the main reasons for using it is that the batteries in these sensors uh, are expected to last. One set of batteries should, protect, it should last for years. And so, for example, the device at the top should run off a couple of AA batteries, which, as we all know, are dirt cheap. You can pick them up pretty much anywhere. And that will run for at least a year on a set of AA batteries. The sensors beneath them run on more powerful, more efficient batteries. Um, and some of the ones that we're deploying into agriculture have got an expected battery lifetime of seven to 10 years. So the maintenance on these is very, very low. So they send the data they collect over to a gateway, which is a bit like the router you've got uh, for your wireless at home. Uh, except the difference is that the signal that they use and the, the wavelength that they use means that we've got a range of anywhere up to 30 miles across open countryside. But at the same time, it's very, very low data rates. So you wouldn't want to watch Netflix on it or anything like that. But we've still got the data. And on the right, you can see what happens when we take that data and turn it into information. And you can see the cold store freezers. You can see the office temperatures. You can see the meeting room statuses. You can see the customer satisfaction scores. And again, here, you know, it's you know, how happy are you with the service you received? You know, good through to awful. But it could equally be, you know, how happy are you with the PPE that we're supplying? All of that kind of thing. So, oh, sorry, just go back here a minute. So, one of the things we can do once we've got this information is, of course, we can alert on that information. So for those of you who are in uh, the retail, uh, the retail um, space or the, the catering space or, or food, food manufacturing, instead of having two of your staff walking around the shop floor every hour and checking the temperatures on each individual freezer and cold store, we can put the sensors into the freezers and fridges and they'll take a measurement however frequently you want from every five minutes through to every few hours and what we can then do is because we've got that data we can turn it into information and we can say okay well if you get within four degrees of the food standards agency or the british retail consortium's guidelines send an alert to this particular team within the organization and let them know that the one that this particular fridge needs fixing. So it's not just one of our fridges has a problem and we've discovered it because we've seen there's some water leaking at the bottom. It's not, we know that this fridge has a problem because the last time two of our staff went to check on it, this is what they found. It's, this is the upward trend in temperature. This is how much longer based on that we think we've got before it breaches the temperature. So that gives us you enough time to remove whatever it is you're storing in that particular fridge or freezer and move it into a different fridge or freezer or cold store room or you know, whatever it is you're, wherever it is you're storing your things. But you've also just freed up two members of staff from taking five minutes out of their day for each of the freezers and going and checking on them every hour. 
Now, obviously, you know, if you've got, you know, sort of ten, if you've got ten freezers, then that's nearly an hour, right? So you can use this to save that time and help the staff perhaps do things that are more valuable to your organization and more efficient. So let's move on and look a bit at customer flow, which as I say, was one of the, one of the things that we're, we're talking to a number of people about at the moment. And this could be a shop, it could be a warehouse. It, it doesn't really matter to be honest. You've got, it's a similar kind of layout. You've got doors at either end. You've got aisles of either parcels, if it's a warehouse or food products or toys or whatever it is you sell. And then you've got some kind of packaging and checkout area. Um, at the bottom. And prior to COVID-19, people would come in either set of doors and just sort of scatter all over the store and walk in any direction they wanted to. And they might come in one set of doors and go out the other, or they might come in the same set of doors, that go out the same set of doors they came in and all the rest of it. And that was fine because we didn't need to worry about any of the social distancing. We didn't need to worry about any of the infection rates or, or anything like that. But that's never going to work when social distancing is something we need to enforce. So let's look at what it might look like and what I know and what we've all seen on the news shops are already doing. And then let's look at how we can augment those processes and start putting in some sensors to give us some data so we can turn that into information. So the first thing a lot of places have done is they've put in barriers to make sure that they force a particular flow of people. So they come in through one door and they walk down through all the various aisles, following the arrows on the floor, following the markers that say keep two meters apart, around past the checkout area, down and out a different set of doors than the ones they came in. So this is great because you're shepherding the flow, you're making sure people are staying two meters apart, you've lost an aisle, maybe even an aisle and a half of packaging space because you've only got so many aisles and it's difficult to you know, route the customers accordingly. But if this stays this way, then what you might find is that actually you can make the shelving units taller or you can put units on the end of the build of the aisles or something like that to compensate for the lost space. What you may even do is decide that actually you can remove an aisle completely and space the other ones out even further, which allows you to social distance more, which allows you to keep your customers and your staff even safer. But there's a problem with this, which is that if you're flowing, if people or indeed anything is flowing around in this kind of pattern, then you're going to get to a point where you can't allow people in because not enough people have left. And a lot of places are solving this by having people stood on the doors with walkie talkies, just clicking people in and clicking people out. And as soon as someone goes out, a radio message, someone uses that picks up the radio, radios back to the people on the entrance door and says, yeah, okay, that's fine. You can let people in. But why can't we be more intelligent about this kind of thing? Why can't we put some people counters on the doors at either end of the, the flow? Because that way, as long as the number, as long as the difference between the counter that's on the exit doors and the counter that's on the entrance doors is within whatever the threshold is for your facility, and it might be 40 people, it might be 300 people, it depends on the size of the venue then we know that we've got a pretty decent chance of helping our customers and helping our staff maintain distance and decrease the risk of getting infected. And it also means that actually all you really need is a member of staff or some members of staff on the entrance door to say, okay, that's fine, you can go in now. But you could go even further than that. I mean, you could put up, many of you will be familiar with these sort of industrial beacons. You could put up one of these. People in the UK seem to be really, really good at obeying traffic lights, be it on the roads or at 
you know, swimming pools when, remember those? They were, they were a thing. Swimming pools with slides. We used to go there once. And yeah, you know, people wait at the top of the flumes for the lights to go green before they go down. It's almost ingrained in our psyche. And so you could put up these kind of lamps at the entrance doors and then automatically have the system say, okay, I've seen three people leave. Therefore, I'll count three people in. And as soon as I've counted three people in, I'll set the thing to red again. So now we're counting people through, but we haven't looked at what things are like when people are in there. So let's start adding in some more temperatures. Let's start adding in some environmental sensors at various points around the shop. Now here I've picked three points reasonably randomly. So you've got one as they've come into the shop, one as they're going around the shop or the warehouse or whatever it is, and one as they're on their way out. But these devices are really inexpensive. We've got some that do very basic temperature and humidity and they're, they're less than a hundred pounds plus about each. Okay, so they're, they're really not expensive when it comes to this kind of thing. And if you've got a sizable warehouse or shop or something like that, then actually putting these in so that you know what the temperature and the humidity is like in the various parts of your warehouse where people are more likely to congregate purely because of the way the flow works. Then you can start to look for the patterns there as well. And then finally, because we can, let's ask people on the way out, how do you think we're dealing with COVID-19? How do you think we're dealing with social distancing here? Are we doing a good job? Because if they start to say, if it starts off as, oh, I think you're doing a great job, and then those numbers start to fall away, then you know that you've got information that tells you that the perception of how your lockdown measures are going or your, your social distancing measures are going is not as good as it used to be. So then you can go back and you can revisit and say, okay, well, maybe we do need to check, keep an eye on the temperature more and make sure that it doesn't get too hot. Maybe we need to allow fewer people in. Maybe, you know, and you can start to ask all of these other questions, which of course leads to wanting to put in more sensors to collect more data, to get more information. And it is a cycle. And it, it, it's quite addictive. But that's the kind of that's an example of the kind of things that you can do with regards to customer flow. Alternative ordering is a, an interesting one as well. Um, a few years ago when I was living in London, uh, I found this little guy driving around the street. Um, I don't know why I assumed it was male. Um, it just looked like it to me for some reason. Um, but anyway, uh, this is an Amazon robot pod and you can place your Amazon Prime order. And back then, this is two years ago, I don't know if they're still driving around the streets of London, um, but you can place your order and it would drive to your location. And then you tap your phone to it and the lid would pop up and you'd take your parcel up and then it would just happily scurry off back to its warehouse to charge up. That's fantastic if you're a multi-billion dollar global corporation. You know, it works, works really, really well. Unfortunately, most of us, much as we'd like to be, on at the kind of scale where we can just plow a load of you know millions and millions of pounds into robotics. So instead, what we're talking to people about is setting up dedicated parking bays in the same way that Morrison's and all the rest of it would, and then putting in some parking sensors. So as soon as a car parks in the bay, so you, you place your order online or you ring them up and they say, okay, that's great. Please come and collect it at half past three. And you say, okay, that's great. Half past three, you drive over. You park up in the bay that they've told you to, so bay A, bay two, whatever it is. And their staff automatically get an alert that says, by the way, there's a car parked in the parking bay. And it's this bay and it's this time. So it's probably this order. And the staff can do a very quick look out the window or check a, you know, a CCTV camera or something like that. Check the number plate in the car against the order list. Wheel out the trolley, place, all the, place the order in the boot of the vehicle and the customer drives off. And they haven't had to get out of the car, they haven't had to worry about social distancing or anything like that. And more to the point, you've not had to fork out millions of pounds on your own robotics lab uh, in order to get you know, little pods like the, the one on the screen. So as you can see, one of, the things, uh, one of the things I'm trying to get across here is that mitigating these risks doesn't need to be complicated at all. You can keep it really simple, you can keep it very affordable. 
and yet you can still get really good results. So let's have a bit of an in-depth look at, at maintenance. Um, I've not got many more things to discuss and then I'll start uh, looking at some questions. Um, but the, the little grey box at the top of the, the, uh, the screen there with a the solar panel on it is actually a GPS tracker. And you can charge it up via USB, it's got a battery inside it. But even here in Wales, and, and those of you that know Wales will know that um, the last few weeks of staggeringly hot sunshine are, are absolutely an anomaly as opposed to the norm. Um, even here in Wales, this thing will last two to three months without needing to be recharged, happily sending back GPS data. So this is great. So we fit these to tractors and, and all sorts of other vehicles and they drive around the farms and everything like that and relay back their information. And we can do things like, well, it's three o'clock in the morning. We're not convinced that tractor should be moving. Um, you know, we should probably alert someone like that. There's something, someone about that, get them out of bed, all of that kind of stuff. But also inside these, they've got accelerometers. And the accelerometers are sensitive enough to sense vibration. So what we're now looking at doing with a couple of organizations is actually taking that vibration data and turning it into information and saying, okay, this engine, the engine in this vehicle has been running for this many hours. We know that if we go beyond X number of hours, then we need to book it in for a service. So let's start booking the services when it's 70% of the way through that time period. And you start to move into this role of almost preventive maintenance, where you're not waiting for things to break, you're not waiting for that niggling little sound, you're not waiting for someone to come in off the yard and say, oh, yeah, I've had that forklift truck out today and it doesn't, there's something about it, it doesn't quite feel right. What you're getting is an alert that says, actually the vibrations are greater than normal or they're less than normal, or this is traveling faster than usual or slower than usual. And from that data, the information that we can get is the state of the vehicle itself. So it's reasonably early days in doing the analysis on that for us, but collecting the data just comes as part of deploying this GPS tracker. And it wasn't one of the reasons we decided to deploy it originally, but it's starting to become really, really valuable. And then we've got the weather conditions as well. And again, you know, a lot of farmers um, leave their tractors sat outside all year round. Uh, I've worked at industrial places where the forklift trucks, rightly or wrongly, were, were left outside and the, the tugs for the trailer, articulated trailers certainly were. And if we can look at the weather over a period of time, be it you know, the amount of rainfall or the amount of sunlight or you know, all of that kind of thing, then we can start to look at the patterns in that as well and we can start to correlate it with the GPS tracking and the, and the vibration sensing and all, everything like that. And we can start to say, okay, well, it's been raining, you know, that, that thing's been sat out in the rain for the last however many months. We should probably pull it into the dry and give it a complete overhaul and just make sure that there isn't any rust creeping in or anything like that. And I do know another company who are using similar sensors to the GPS trackers, and they're fixing them to machines on the shop floor. And they're actually using the vibration sensors inside these devices to let them know when ball bearings are starting to wear out and things like that. And again, that's leading them into proactive maintenance, which is saving them a huge amount of time uh, and, and making their machinery a lot more efficient. And their machinery is lasting longer as well because they're looking after it more appropriately. So in summary, the, I mean, these, are, these are the steps that we always go through with our customers regardless of what the brief is, but particularly when you're looking to mitigate risk. Work out what do you need to monitor? What are the factors that contribute to this risk that you know of? Don't try and second guess all of them. Start small and build. Because as you start to build up the information, then you'll discover that You'll, you'll think, oh, well, maybe that's happening because of this. Well, let's go and monitor that as well. Like I say, it, it is addictive. It is quite a slippery slope. But once you've worked out what you need to monitor, go and collect the data. Turn that data into information. 
take action based on the information, whether that's a text message to someone's phone, an email, feeding into existing monitoring and alerting systems, putting up big red and green lights all over the place, that kind of thing. It doesn't really matter because it's what works best for you. And then take action on that. But also automate as much as possible. Because the more and more you automate, the more and more you, re you remove one of the biggest factors that's in any kind of risk at all. And that's us. It's people. And whilst I don't want to suggest that you immediately make your workforce redundant and employ significant numbers of robots, what we're finding, be it on the farms with our gates, so we've got these gate sensors, uh, which tell us when ramblers have left gates open and things like that. Um, whether it's on the farms where we've fitted gate sensors and so the farmer doesn't have to drive around their estate for half of the day checking the gates, they can focus their time on actually farming. Or whether it's in the fridges and freezers, as I spoke about with the temporary probes, and members of staff not having to go around and constantly check stuff. What you're doing is you're freeing up those staff members to be more valuable to your business and to contribute in areas where they're most needed as opposed to carrying out sort of menial, menial tasks. So I'm going to leave it there. I hope that that's been useful to people. I'm more than happy to take questions uh, now and indeed afterwards. Um, you can see our website's at the bottom of the slide. That's our Twitter handle. Uh, our email address, I'll make sure that that gets um, sent to you all after the presentation and uh, the recording of this will be online as well. Um, so thank you very much for your time and uh, if there's any questions I'll stop sharing my screen um, and I'll, I'm more than happy to take those.